Grace and peace, everyone. Today is Sunday, December 26, 2021. Welcome to the Christ Fellowship Baptist Church Sunday School Meeting, where our pastor is the Reverend Dr. David L. Kelly II. My name is Dolores Gerald, and I am your facilitator for this meeting. We meet every Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. If you would like more information about our church, please visit our website at www.ChristFellowshipBaptistChurch.org. Our lesson today is titled, The Consequence of Justice. It is taken from Nahum chapter 1. So get your Bibles out and let us pray. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we give you glory, honor, and praise. Thank you for being God and God all by yourself. Thank you for being the one who sits high and looks low and sees each and every one of us meets us in the place of our need. Father God, right now, I ask that you come in the midst of this meeting, touch every heart, every eye, every ear, every, every mind, every spirit that they would receive, whatever it is Holy Spirit has for us. Holy Spirit, I've done the preparation, but I sit down, you stand up, you do the teaching, give me clarity of speech, clarity of thought, singleness of mind, in order to do what it is that you have called me to do on this day. Father God, I ask a blessing on each and every family represented here, my church family at large, Father God, my pastor, and every pastor represented here right now. In the name of Jesus, I ask that you gird them up on every week and lead inside. Father God, that they are prepared to go out and do whatever it is that you have them do in the vineyard. Put a hedge of protection around them and their family. Hallelujah in the mighty name of Jesus. And we ask all of these blessings in Jesus' mighty matchless name. Amen. 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 Okay. Roxy has said she'll read. So, Roxy, whenever you're ready, start. Am I reading the whole chapter? The whole chapter. Thank you. Okay. The Burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. God El is. God is jealous and the Lord revenges. The Lord revenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his seed. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him, burnt at his presence, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger. His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble and he knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof and darkness shall pursue, pursue his enemies. What do ye imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. For while they be folding together as thorns, and while they be drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stumble, fully dry. There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet and likewise many, yet thus shall be cut down. When he shall pass through, though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. For now will I break his yoke from off thee and will burst thy bonds in thunder. And the Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee that no more of thy name be sown. Out of the house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image and the molten image. I will make thy grave for thou art vile. Behold upon mountains, the feet of him that bringeth good tidings 
that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall be more pass through thee. The, the wicked shall no more be shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. Amen. 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 Thank you. Okay, family. Um, we're in the book of Nahum. It's a it's a minor prophet. Nahum is one of the minor prophets. And might have means that his writings were not very long. Not that his message wasn't important, but that his writings were not very long. This book is only three chapters. And it is particular to um, a specific people and a specific time. And so Nahum's prophecy was to the Assyrians, in particular to their capital city, Nineveh. All right. And, and if you remember, the Ninevites were given a prophecy by Jonah some 100 years ago, so uh, years earlier. So when you look at the book of Jonah, it's like the first chapter of the book in the Ninevites as far as God is going to judge them. And although at the time of Jonah, they repented of their evil and they turned away from their violent habits, eventually they fell right back into them. The Assyrians were known for their cruelty to their enemies. The historic record shows that they would impale their captives on poles. You know, just put them on a stake and hang them up there. And they would do it in such a way that they would miss all the major organs. So they'd be hanging up in the air until they died. It was worse than crucifixion. All right. Flay. They would flay their um, skin off of them it right off of them and then stake them to the ground so that they would um die in pain stripped out in the sun they would literally bake in the sun while they bled to death it was just horrible they would um behead them and then place their heads on top of the stakes right and 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 one of the things that they were particularly cruel about was they would take their captives to faraway places. And what they would do is march them and they would be relentless about them. And, and some of these marches were called death marches because a lot of people died along the way. They were also known for their merciless treatment of all of their conquered enemies, but they were particularly cruel to the inhabitants of Judah. And it's for this cause that Nahum was given this prophecy against them. And so we start our lesson. Verse one, the burden against Nineveh, the book, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. All right. So here we have the introduction to this writing. First, it is identified as a burden. All right. Many times in scripture, a prophecy of doom or destruction or punishment against the nation is called a burden. And the word in Hebrew means oracle or utterance. All right. And it's, and it's heavy and it carries a great deal of weight. And it's usually a sure sign of, of destruction or punishment, as it is usually in the last series of warnings from the Most High God. All right. This prophecy was given to Nahum in a vision from God, which he wrote down in a scroll or a book. Thus is the identification that is from Yahweh, as he always speaks to his messengers, the prophets, in dreams and visions, all right? The destruction of Nineveh happened about 50 years later, okay? Verse two says, God is jealous and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversary and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and in, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry and dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither and the flower of Lebanon wilts. The mountains quake before him, the hills melt and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Amen. Okay. The next verse starts out stating attributes of Yahweh. First, he is jealous. And in this case, it means zealous, meaning he's passionate, fervent, committed, and dedicated to his word and his people. 
Second, he avenges, meaning that he protects those under his care and takes revenge against their enemies. Know this, those that come against you come against the most high God. He is able to protect and defend those under his protections, as the Egyptians found out in Exodus 14, 19, and 20. <clears throat> when the angel of God, who went before the camp of Israel, he was leading them, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it became, so it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of the Israelites. Thus it was a cloud and a darkness to one. And it was a, and it gave light by night to the other, so that it, one did not come near the other all that night. Amen. It, it, it was a wall of protection from the enemy and a doorway of escape for the Israelites. All right. For the enemy, it blocked their military in advance. All right. And, and then it turned around and became a doorway to their utter destruction. God, our Father, is able to protect us while defending us at the same time. He's able to keep us from harm and attacks while delivering us from the dead-end situations that we find ourselves in. Glory be to God. He is a God who can do all things well. All right? He knows the affliction of his own. Just as Yeshua told Saul in Acts 9, verses 4 and 5, when he was persecuting the followers of Jesus... He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Right? And then the Lord Yeshua struck him blind. He struck him blind. He didn't just, he didn't say, okay, you're persecuting me. He, he, he told him about himself. And then he struck him blind. <laughs> Yahweh knows his own and is fully able to protect avenge and exact revenge against those who come against his own. Know this, saints of God. You do not need to take action against your enemies. The Lord says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, and he will repay in his own time, in his own way. Because remember, his ways are higher than our ways. And he knows how to do it and make sure it gets done right. And, and, and done correctly the first time. Glory be to God. All right. Now, third, he is furious or wrathful, meaning he has great anger. Not that the Lord is not in control of his anger, but that his anger is righteous because it is against those who first transgress against the widow the orphan, the stranger in the land, the poor. And, and, and second, they come. he comes against those who unjustly and cruelly come against people causing injustice, oppression, and sorrow. And then he, he's against those who operate unjustly and take advantage of those who have the least and suffer the most. These are those who rarely have an advocate and who almost never have representation. And almost all the time, they suffer in silence. But God hears their heart cries, like he did in Genesis 8, verses 20 and 21, when the Lord said, Behold, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great. And because this sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to against again that has come to me and if not i will know it amen he comes down to check on his people he answers them he avenges them against those who oppress him in fact he reserves wrath for the oppressors because the lord is slow to anger meaning that every little thing is not a cause for him to exact punishment. He will allow the iniquity being committed to be piled up to a level where fitting punishment can be rendered. As, is the, as was the case of the Amorites in Genesis 15, verse 16, 
when Yahweh told Abraham concerning his descendants, but in the fourth generation, they shall return here. But the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And when the iniquity was complete in God's Kairos timing, the Israelites came in and conquered the land. Even in the case of prophecy coming forth to bless, God's Kairos time is at work. As the word says in Galatians 4, 4 and 5, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the Lord, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Amen. Yahweh is great in power and does not at all allow the guilty to go unpunished. They will be dealt with in his own time. We are encouraged to wait on the Lord. In his mighty power, he punishes the guilty, those who have transgressed against his law, his righteousness, and his justice, and not one of them can escape. As it says in Hebrews 10, verses 30 and 31, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Amen. And who can rescue from his hand? Nobody. All right. And then we could continue with the attributes of God. The Lord is over the entire earth, as it says in Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist. And then again, in Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2, where it says, The earth is the Lord, and all is fullness, the world, and those that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Amen. Verse 3b, the second half of verse 3, and Nahum says that the Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Meaning that Yahweh is in control of everything, even the whirlwind. The cyclone, the twister, or the, the tornado, which are the modern names of the whirlwind, all right? Even as they are let loose to do what they're going to do, they are operating in the will of God. Whirlwinds have been known to leave a land desolate and devoid of vegetation, right? The pillar of cloud by day and fire by night was classified as a whirlwind, all right? And this is probably why. The Israelites associate the whirlwind with Yahweh. Whirlwinds were also associated with storms, especially when they were on sea or in the ocean. All right. Um, this is probably why <laughs> Yahweh is considered to be in the storm. All right. Because he's in control of all things nature. One of the things that happened when Jesus came, when he rebuked the wind, he demonstrated that he was God because God is in control of nature. And, that, and now that you understand why the Israelites believed that God was in the whirlwind and God was in the storms, you can understand why the disciples' reaction was, what manner of man is this who can control the wind and the waves? Amen. It says, the clouds are the dust of his feet. That could be a recollection of the description of the mountaintop visitation to the children of Israel at Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb as it is sometimes called, where the cloud descended down on the mountaintop, as it says in Exodus 19, verses 19 and 16. And the Lord said to Moses, behold, I come down to you in the thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe forever. And then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And it's in Exodus 34, verse 5, where it says, Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the word, the name of the Lord. Descended means to come down. And since it sits on the top of the mountain, it is believed to be his footstool. And the clouds moving or stirring the dust falling from his feet. Verse 4 says, He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. And he dries up all the rivers. This attribute speaks to the miracles when the Lord caused the sea to go back 
by a strong east wind all that night. All right, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. In Exodus 14 and 21, and then again in Joshua 3, chapter 13, when as those who bore the ark came to the Jordan and the feet of the priests dipped into the edge of the water, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose up in a heap, so that the waters that went down to the sea fell and were cut off, and the people crossed over opposite Jericho. And the priests who bore the ark of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan and all Israel crossed over on dry ground all right and and we talked about that in a previous lesson the significance of a body of water moving and leaving dry ground if you've ever um, seen rain when it stops raining and the ground is not dry it's still wet it takes a while to dry out but when the Lord does things he can do them completely amen then it makes reference to Bashan and Carmel withering and the flower of Lebanon wilting. Bashan in that time was famous for its rich pastures and thick forests. All right. And Carmel was known for its lush vineyard. It was also known as God's garden or God's vineyard. And Lebanon was known for its thick forests of cedar trees, which Solomon traded to get timber for it, to build the temple, the temple and his palace. And so considering that these places were renowned for their lushness and fertility and for their, their, their fruitfulness, it's easier to comprehend why if these areas were all of a sudden to become barren or to wilt or to wither, that it would be the work of the Lord doing that because he controls everything. If it was to happen all of a sudden, they would know it was the Lord because he can do it and it would be complete. All right. Then it lists that the mountains quake before him, the hills melt, and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. This seems to be symbolic language of how the movement of Yahweh affects the environment as he moves. First, the mountains quake as he proceeds, as they did in the Mount Sinai visitation. As it says in Exodus 19 and 18, now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke. Because the Lord descended upon it in fire, its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. You need to know that Israel is in an earthquake zone, and earthquakes and their effects happen periodically. So let's take a look at some of the things that happen during an earthquake to better get a better understanding of what the writer is saying and what the Israelites believe concerning some of these attributes of Yahweh. First, in an earthquake, the ground shakes. And it not only shakes, it literally rises up and down. It moves up and down. And, and that's what heaving is. It's an up and down movement. So when the earth is shaken and it heaves at the same time during an earthquake, everything loose on it moves, all right? Things like rocks and boulders and pebbles and the like. And since Israel is, is in mountainous or hilly terrain, everything would roll downhill during an earthquake. And so here you have the expression, the hills, the mountain, because the rocks are shaking loose and they're flowing down. The boulders are shaking loose and they're flowing down and everything is coming down. So it looks like the hill is literally melting or coming apart as the quake is happening. All right. And so the hills melting would be an accurate description of what the observers were witnessing or experiencing. Does anybody have any questions about what I've covered? so far any questions at all amen all right verse six and who can stand before his indignation and who can endure the fierceness of his anger his fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him the lord is good a stronghold in the day of trouble and he knows those who trust in him but with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place and darkness will pursue his enemies. Amen. 
The writer then goes on to ask, who can stand before his indignation and who can endure the fierceness of his anger? And the answer is no one. Again, I quote Hebrew 10, verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. There is none who can escape his justice. Ask the Egyptians in the time of Moses. Ask the Midianites in the time of Gideon. Ask the Syrians in the time of Deborah. Ask the Israelites in the time of their complete disobedience. Yahweh's righteous indignation and zealous commitment to his word will always go forth and accomplish what he says it will. The writer then states that his fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. This is a description of the hell of the seventh plague against Egypt, as it says in Exodus 9, 23 and 24. And the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire darted to the ground. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt so that there was hail and fire mingled with the hail. Amen. I think that's a very apt analogy of the wrath of God. Because hell is also one of the woes and judgments in Revelation 16, verse 21, where it says there was a terrible hailstorm and the hailstones weighing as much as 75 pounds fell from the sky onto the people below. Amen. And then we go from the wrath of God in his judgment to the protection of God in his provision and mercy. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. A stronghold is a place of refuge and protection, a fortified place of security, a fortress where a person who is being pursued can run into for safety and shelter from their enemies. And the Lord is a stronghold to those who trust in, rely on and depend on him and have hope in him. He knows them. He knows their heart and takes care of them. As Psalm 46, 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. For their safety and benefit, he becomes an overwhelming flood of calamity to their enemies. He will remove them from their position and make an end of their activities. He will say, as he said to the children of Israel in Exodus 14, verse 13, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. But the Egyptians or the enemy whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. <coughs> it says darkness will pursue his enemies meaning that they will fall into obscurity, be removed away from the life and the being of the protected of the Lord. I mean, think about the times when you ask the Lord to get you out of something because somebody or something was coming against you. Has that same particular situation ever come up again? The Lord, when he delivered you from that, it never rose up again. Glory be to God. Verse nine. What do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. For while tangled like thorns and while drunken like drunkards, they shall be devoured like stubble fully dry. For from you comes forth one who plots evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Amen. The next verses are specific to Assyria, but could be applicable to any enemy of the children of the Most High Yahweh. The writer says, what do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. Then he says, from you comes forth one who plots evil against the Lord. This reminds me of Isaiah 54, verse 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. The enemy will plot and plan and even launch weapons of destruction against you. But they will not prevail, succeed, or triumph over you. The Lord, who is your stronghold and, and strong tower, will protect. He will shield you from all weapons of the enemy. How? While they are still tangled in their plot. While they're still drunken on the excitement of their plans, they will be removed by the Lord like dried stubble is disposed of in the fire. Never to be seen again. Never to rise up to afflict the righteous again. Glory be to God. Any questions about what I, what I, what I covered so far? 
Amen. Verse 12. Woo. Thus says the Lord, though they are safe and likewise many, yet in this manner they will be cut down. When he passes through, though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. For now, I will break off the yoke from you and burst your bonds apart. Amen. These two verses are spoken concerning the Assyrian threat to the children of Israel. However, they also speak to the children of the kingdom of heaven as well. Those who plot a plan against you may think they are safe from detection and exposure. They may think that they are powerful, strong, and untouchable. However, they have not encountered the almighty, omnipotent, ever-living, omniscient God. He is able to deliver even in the most unlikely and hopeless circumstances. Even as the enemy comes up to attack you, the Lord is able to turn that attack into a victory for you. Even when the enemy is more powerful than you are, the Lord will give you victory out of what looks like sure defeat. Even if you were being corrected, by the discipline of the Lord, he will burst the bonds of the weapon and method of correction off of you and break the yoke of affliction that was put on you so that you are truly delivered from the hand of the enemy. And that enemy will never come at you ever again. God is faithful that way. When he removes something, that something does not come back at you again. Something else might try, but that's something that he takes away won't ever come at you again. Amen. Sonia, you had a question. I saw you on mute and mute. You got a question? No? Okay. Verse 14. The Lord has given a command concerning you. Your name shall be perpetuated no longer. Out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the molded image. I will dig your grave for you are vile. Although this verse is spoken concerning the Assyrian, the Assyrian oppressors of Israel, it is applicable to any enemy to the kingdom of heaven and to any enemy of the children of God in that kingdom. First, the Lord speaks a word against the enemy. And we know that the Lord says in Isaiah 55 and 11, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So he spoke a word against the enemy. Second, the name of the enemy will cease to be relevant to those that have been previously afflicted. All right. So third, they will be removed because they are contemptible in the sight of Yahweh and they do not follow his way. They don't follow his commands or align up with his will. So he's going to remove them. All sin will be removed from his presence. That's the purpose of the lake of fire, which was created for the devil and his, and his angels. However, those who refuse to repent and submit to the righteous will of the Father, those who refuse to believe in his son, our King and Savior, Jesus, Yeshua, they too will wind up in that same lake of fire because of sin. Verse 15, behold, on the mountains, the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feast, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. Amen. This verse is an assurance that the word of the Lord will come to pass. The reader is encouraged to behold, to look with intention, to understand that on the mountain or hilltop, look there. Like it says in Psalms 121 verses 1 and 2, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from which comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And who or what is to be looked for? The feet of the person or the messenger who brings good news of peace or deliverance from the enemy. The message that the siege is over, that the famine has ended, that the enemy is defeated that the Lord has triumphed over the enemy on behalf of his people again. 
The message applies to us, the children of God in the kingdom as well. We ought to look to, to, towards heaven for our help comes from him in times of distress, in times of trouble, in times of fear and tribulation. Look towards the hill or the sky to our father who is in heaven. We ought to look to our king and savior and ask for what we need in his name. And we can expect an answer of peace even in the midst of our circumstances and situation. For it says in Psalm 91, verse 14 and 15, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, meaning he'll lift you up, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Glory be to God. When you look to God, when you trust God, when you believe in him, he will lift you up out of your circumstances. Even he will lift your head so that you can get peace even as the chaos is going on around you. Glory be to God because he's that good to each and every one of us. Then there's the command. Then, wait, I'm sorry. And then there's the word that says he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Again, this all is hinging on the fact that you trust the Lord, that you believe him, that you that you not trying to walk in your own understanding, but trusting and believing that he can do what he said he will do. His promises are yea and amen. Then there is the command to the people of Judah. First, they are to keep the Lord's appointed feast. That is to go up to the house of God and worship him for the deliverance that he has brought about for them. They are, they are to celebrate the provision of the Lord by keeping the spring and fall feast. That is Passover, the, the feast of unleavened bread, which happens at the time of barley. That the, the barley harvest, the Pentecost, which happens at the time of the wheat harvest. And the faith and the tabernacle. And the Feast of the Tabernacles, <laughs> glory be to God, which happens at the time when the barley is about to be sold, all right? We, they, they are not to forget the appointed Feast of the Lord, all right? And second, they are to honor the vows that they made during their time of distress. You know those vows. The ones that said, Lord, if you get me out of this, then vows. Lord, if you just take this away, then vows. You know, the ones where you say, I will do if you do, then vows. You, he wants them to honor those vows, all right? Any vow made to the Lord is not to be taken lightly. Man may think the vow is trivial, but God takes all vows seriously, and he will hold the speaker of the vow accountable to what he has vowed to do. So the writer encourages the people to perform their vows, meaning do what it is that you said you would do. And, and, and a message to us today, which is dropping in my spirit right now, you, we need to be mindful of the things that we say we're going to do for the Lord, because whether you know it or not, you're going to do it, whether you intend to or not. So, so be mindful of the vows that you make to the Lord. Right? This message is applicable to us today as well. We've been through some trying times in the last couple of years. We too need to celebrate the deliverance from our enemy of sickness and infirmity in the form of this COVID virus. The Lord has kept from danger and harm of this virus. Glory be to God. He kept us safe from danger and harm in this virus. All right. Even those of us who have caught it. We are here to declare victory over the enemy. Glory be to God. That God delivers. That God heals. That God keeps. Mm. And we need to remember that we are to worship the Lord and honor any vows that we made him during our times of distress and trouble. Remember, any vow made to the Lord is not to be taken lightly. God takes all vows seriously and he will hold the speaker of the vow accountable to what they have vowed to do. Amen. Oh, glory be to God. Amen. Okay. People of Judah are given a reason to follow this command. The wicked, ungodly, worthless one, in this case, the Assyrian king, shall not pass through or not 
will not afflict them anymore. Glory be to God. All right. But he has been utterly cut off or destroyed. That indeed was a cause of celebration for the people. Glory be to God. That indeed was a celebration for the people. All right. But they have been afflicted by the Assyrian for almost 300 years. And the time of their affliction was now over. I don't know if you remember when we did the last lesson, I talked about that Nephtali and Zebulun were the first ones to be overrun by the Assyrians. They had been in captivity to the Assyrians or under control of the Assyrians for almost 50 plus years before they came down and took over Israel. And then it was a hundred years or so before they, um, uh, with, with they came against Judah. So, and even in the midst of all of that, they were always raised from the Assyrians. So they were under affliction by the Assyrians for almost 300 years. And the Lord declared that the time of their affliction is now over. This brings us a message of hope as well. We who are in the body of Christ, who are children of the most high God and citizens of the kingdom of heaven have reason to celebrate. We have been, li we have been delivered from the hands of the enemy into the hands of the king, Jesus, Yeshua, who says in John 10, verses 27 to 30, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. Glory be to God. We're secure in the hands of the king. Nobody can take us out of the hands of our Lord and Savior. Glory be to God. That is a cause of celebration. Even when the enemy comes against you like a flood, God will lift you up. He will give you peace in the midst of that flood. He will give you comfort in the midst of that flood. He's not going to always take you out of your affliction, but he sure will keep you even in the midst of your affliction. And for that, we ought to give him glory and praise. That's the end of my lesson. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody have any comments on anything that I've spoken of? You can unmute yourself and ask now. Glory be to God. Anybody? Wow, that, we need to really take heart to that lesson because if we don't obey God's laws and do what we're supposed to do, we become his enemy. And after hearing all of this, oh, oh, oh well, we need to be prayed up and stayed up. And like you said, if he said we're going to do that to do something, we need to do it because we know where God has brought us from. And we need not take our blessings lightly just for granted that like when we wake up in the morning, we should not take all that for granted. When we're laying in our bed. We shouldn't take that. We have a bed for granted. So, yeah, good lesson, Dolores. Good lesson. Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. Any other comments? Any other questions? Anybody? Okay, praise the Lord. Um, we're going to pray out. Let's see, we're going to pick on the pray out. Let's see. I picked on Dee Dee last week. Roxy read for me. Um, I'm going to pick on Terry. Terry, pray us out, please. Most holy God, we come to you today, God, first of all, to say thank you. Thank you for another day that you've allowed us to see, oh God. Thank you for keeping us, oh God. God, we thank you for this lesson, oh God. We thank you for the the teacher that taught this lesson, oh God, to give us word, put a drop in our spirit, oh God, to let you know, to let us know, oh God, that we need to be more thankful to you and to keep our promises that we made to you. Now, God, we ask that you just be with us throughout this day. We ask that you be with each and every pastor that's going to bring a word to their flock, oh God. We ask that you just keep us in your word, oh God. We thank you, we love you, we praise you, and we pray the spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen.